so as you can look around this room here you see garland and lights and stockings and different christmas uh decorations which means and you know some people would say it's a little bit early but i would just tell them they're wrong objectively wrong there's an objective standard of truth and, and, and if you say it's too early for christmas you've um violated that standard <laughs> So we are moving into the most wonderful time of the year. That's what the radio keeps telling us. And around Christmas time, uh, I always try to keep my sermons fresh. But really, like, how many times can you preach the same Charlie Brown sermon, right, before it gets tired and stale and old? I remember the first Christmas sermon I ever preached was the, the Charlie Brown uh, passage from Luke. But, you know, you can't just do that every year. It becomes predictable, and people are like, okay, and it... Although the passage is still powerful and the passage is still true, uh, it can become repetitive and people just lose interest. So this year I thought, forget it. I won't even bother. I won't even do Christmas theme or anything like that. Uh, I'll just continue Genesis. We'll put up some Christmas decorations. We'll sing Christmas songs. But as far as the preaching's concerned, we'll just keep doing Genesis because um, I just didn't want to bother with um, trying to think of a fresh new hip christmas series i'm like whatever genesis is good enough then i got to genesis 38 and it happened to fall around this time of year when i was going to put up these decorations this week anyways um and this is a passage that many preachers skip and i i, I get why i really understand why you would want to skip this uh passage but i read it over and then uh in my bible uh, software it gave me a cross reference to matthew 1 3 which is this exhilarating passage that says, In Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. Yes, it's the genealogy of Jesus chapter. That chapter that we open to, and if we're honest, we've skipped before, right? Anybody ever open Matthew and, or, or think, you know what, I'm going to read the whole New Testament and then they get to Matthew 1 and they go, uh, let's just get to 2. <laughs> it, that, it, or at least Matthew 1.18 because that genealogy and these names, are a lot of times we, um, we can skip that because we don't think it's, it's relevant for us. What do a bunch of Hebrew names have to do with me in 2022? But embedded in this short little verse with these names... These strange names. I don't know who's naming their kid Perez and Zara and Hezron anymore. Maybe we should. I don't know. Embedded in these names, the short little verse, are the lives and stories of the forefathers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this particular passage, with these particular names, is embedded a story about marriage, widowhood, death, deception, prostitution, vindication, and twin baby boys. <laughs> I know that sounds like the plot of an R-rated movie. But believe it or not, this story is one of the most powerful Christmas passages I've ever studied. And I'm glad I got to study it around this time of year because it really popped out to me. So by the end of this sermon, I hope to show you that this little passage in the middle of a seemingly boring genealogy contains the key of the hope of Christmas itself. Now this is a bumpy ride. So get your seatbelts on and get ready because Genesis 38 is not comfortable. We're going to take a journey from here to the manger. So Genesis 38 verses uh, 1 to 4, it begins like this. It happened that at that time uh, that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she named his name Onan, verse 5 as well. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in uh, Chezib when she bore him. So Genesis 38 is a rather odd chapter, not, not just for the contents of the story itself, but because it's placement in, in the book of Genesis. So last week we learned about Joseph and how, excuse me, his brothers mistreated him, sold him into slavery, 
and how they deceived uh, their father Jacob into thinking that Joseph was killed by a wild animal and they had his bloody robe and they showed him and all that. And and if the book of Genesis was a movie, like this is quite the, the, the this is a crazy cliffhanger. So Joseph's gone, Jacob thinks he's dead. And then all of a sudden we're talking about Judah moving away. Like, okay, <laughs> what happened to Joseph? That's what I'm more interested in. Like that's the overarching you know, narrative here is, is, is the Joseph narrative. And then all of a sudden we have a break at, at the moment where we're asking the question, okay, he's not dead, but his dad thinks he's dead. His brothers lied about him, sold him into slavery. What now? Like what's going on with Joseph? The Bible says not yet. We got to take a break and talk about Judah for a second. So there's no resolution, not yet at least. So Instead of updating us on Joseph's journeys and uh, his adventure in Egypt, we take a detour to talk about Judah. Now, Judah was the brother, if you remember from last week, who convinced the rest of the brothers not to kill him. He's like, guys, what's the profit? You know, he's thinking economically now. Well, what profit is it if we kill our brother? Why don't we just sell him? Then we can make some money and we'll be in this dreamer will go away and, and, and we're more rich. The dreamer's gone. Win win situation. He was a callous man. He didn't care much about God's promises for his forefathers. Uh, so after the mistreatment of Joseph, Judah leaves his brothers and he goes, you know what, guys? I made some money out of this deal. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to leave. I'm leaving our land. I'm going to go off on my own. He goes off and he finds a foreign Canaanite woman and again shows disrespect for the promises of God to his forefathers. Instead of taking a wife from among his own people, people of the promise he goes outside the tribe and he starts having children with pagan with a pagan woman but God's not caught off guard by this his disobedience wouldn't tarnish God's plan and that's a good thing God's promise to Adam and Eve to raise up a seed who would crush the serpent's head destroy the works of evil he would do it and God was um, in the process of it and Judah's disobedience would not stop him so Unlike Joseph, who was forcefully carried away from his brothers, Judah is voluntarily leaving his brothers. And he has three sons with the Canaanite woman, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. The boys grow up, and Judah finds a wife for his firstborn, Ur, and her name was Tamar. Tamar. She too was a Canaanite woman. And it didn't go well for Ur, right? He erred. Nothing, eh? Just a just a grunt. Pun, that pun was intended. Okay, I don't I don't care. It's funny. The Bible tells us in Genesis thirty eight seven that Ur was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Now, what was his particular sin? There's a smirk. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> what was his particular sin? Well, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us his particular sin. All it tells us is he was wicked, and he was so wicked. That God couldn't tolerate him anymore and quite literally put him to death. So now here we have Tamar. She's a widow. She's childless. So Judah tells the next son in line, Onan, he says, Go in to your brother's wife, Tamar, and raise up children for your deceased brothers. This is a practice called um, the, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, leveret marriage. Leveret, leverate. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but it's this, it's, it's called leveret marriage. I'm just going to say that. And that's the practice of a brother marrying his older brother's widow, if she's childless, to have children with her so that the family line doesn't end. So if the younger brother of a married man who dies before he can have children is single, then he has to go in. So Onan is single. His brother's wife is dead. She's childless. His job is to go into her, have children with her so that the family line can continue. But Onan wasn't interested in having children with Tamar. He was interested in, you know, laying with her. That's that's true. But he didn't want children with her. So he would go into her and without getting too graphic, he would just see to it that he did, didn't impregnate her. He had his own methods by which he would ensure. You can read it for yourself in the Bible. I don't want to say too much for the children's sake, but he would see to it that uh, she would not be impregnated by him. God saw how Onan refused to raise up offspring for his deceased brothers, and he put him to death as well. So here's Judah, 
Two of three of his sons are now dead, and Tamar is alive. So how, what would you think? I mean, if I'm in Judah's shoes, I'm thinking, man, this Tamar is a curse. <laughs> my, I, get, I give her to my one son, he dies. My other son, he dies. Two of three are gone. I got one left. What do you do? Son, you don't want to be with this one. You see what's happening to your brothers? Maybe we should just steer clear of Tamar. So instead of uh, sending his last son to Tamar, this is what he tells her in verse 11, very callously. He says, <clears throat> remain a widow in your father's house till uh, Sheila, my son, grows up, for he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. So what does he tell her? He says, Tamar, basically go, go, go away. <laughs> go, go where you came from. Go back from where you came from, Tamar. Uh, when the boy's old, I don't know how old he is, it doesn't really tell us, but he, he's he's young, he's a younger uh, son. So he says, when the boy is old, I'll come get you and then you can marry him and continue this process here. But for now, just go back from where you came from. So, the, like, ask the question, what what had Tamar done? What was her sin? Did she do anything wrong to deserve this type of treatment? It's not her fault, right? It's not her fault that her first husband was a wicked sinner that God killed. It's not her fault that Onan refused to raise up children uh, with her and also got divine execution. It's not her fault. She didn't do anything wrong. She was trying to do the right thing. But yet here she was being mistreated like she was cursed by her father-in-law and sent away, exiled from her husband's family. So this whole situation is just a complete mess. And things were about to get worse for Judah. So how can this get worse? Well, some time passed since Judah sent her away. And Judah's wife that he fathered the, fathered the three sons with, she died. So not only are two of three of his sons dead, but now his wife's dead. So he leaves. And you can imagine he's pretty down in the dumps. Probably depressed, having a hard time. And Tamar gets word that Judah went up to a city called Timnah. So she took off her widow's clothing. She covered herself with a veil. She sat at the entrance of a place called Enaim, which was on the road to Timnah. Now, Tamar knew Judah's youngest son was grown at this point, and she didn't have him yet. So it's becoming evident that Judah is not interested in including her in the family. So what does Tamar do? Well, she takes matters into her own hands. Um, so Judah passes on the road on his way to Timnah and, and he sees this beautiful woman by the gate and she's veiled. Now, the only women who stood veiled near the entrances of cities were prostitutes. I'll just say it. Uh, and Judah was now a single man having a hard time, depressed, perhaps he figures, well, what could it hurt, right? Here's a here's a woman. Let me go. She's beautiful. Let me see what she's offering. So verse 16 tells us the exchange they had. Where's verse 16? He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said... If you give me a pledge until you send it, he said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. And we'll end it there. So Judah didn't know this is his daughter-in-law, obviously, because if he knew, he would have been like, okay, well, what's going on here? Um, why are you by the road? Why are you doing this? So he offers her a young goat in exchange for her services. She agrees, except on one condition. I'll, I need a pledge. I don't see the goats. I need some collateral here so that I know that you will pay me. So she wanted something she could hold on to of his that had value to ensure he will pay her and not just run off with, <laughs> with the goats. So he asked, well, what pledge do you want? What collateral are you seeking? And she says, how about your signet ring, your cord, and your staff? So why these items? Because these are items of identifications. This is like an ancient driver's license or passport. You could use these items to identify a person. They held some value, but 
She was more interested in their utility. I mean, if you just brought a staff in a signet ring to a market, you might not get much for it. But she wasn't looking for the monetary value of these items. She was more interested in being able to identify who it was who slept with her and hopefully, in her mind, impregnated her. This was more important than how much they were worth. So her plan went just as she expected. He agreed, gave her the items. He went into her. She became pregnant. But before he could get his ID back from her, she fled with his stuff. So Judah, he goes, hey, where'd she go? So he goes to some of the men of the city there and he says, where's the uh, cult prostitute that was on the roadside at um, Anaim? You guys, surely you guys know who she is, right? I mean, let's be honest. I'm sure you know. And they look around and they go, there, what prostitute? There's no cult prostitute here. We don't, we don't know anything of this. So <laughs> Judah, this wasn't the answer he's looking for. So what does he do? Well, he just cuts his losses. Like, okay, fine. Verse 23 says, um, he, 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 he's talking to his people here. He replies, he says, well, let her keep the things as her own or she, or we will be laughed at. Um, you see, I sent this young goat and you did not find her. <laughs> he didn't want to endure the embarrassment of what he did. So he tells his people, let's just pretend this never happened. Let's cut our losses and just move on. Put it behind us. Let's move on. But there's one problem. It did happen. And the consequences of it happening were just beginning. So one month passes and there's no consequences. Two months passes and there's still no consequences. After two months, he probably forgot about the woman by the gate that he gave his signet and, and staff and cord to. But she hadn't forgotten about him. Because about three months later, Judah's sin would find him out. Verse 24. And things get real here. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burnt. Wow. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. <clears throat> then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her my son, Selah, and he did not know her again. <laughs> so three months pass after their encounter. He's informed, Your daughter-in-law has been pregnant by immorality. And after, um, after his sons failed to impregnate her, it appears Tamar went off on her own and found some other man from some other tribe to lay with, and Judah could not tolerate this. So what does he say? He says, let her be burned. He shows her no care. He shows her no mercy. He was the one that sent her away. He was the one that didn't update her on the son that she was supposed to have. And now he hears that she's pregnant by another man, by immorality, and he says, how could this be? What an immoral, unjust woman. Her lot is to be burned Put to death. Seems like a hasty decision. No trial. No investigation. Just kill her. Now Judah's probably thinking. Well okay good. I can finally get rid of this woman right. She did something wrong. Let me just kill her. and we're... She'll be dead. My son it will be safe. At least he thinks. But he didn't know what Tamar had up her sleeve. Because she was. As she was being brought out to be executed. She lays out her case. She says hey before you burn me. Can you identify these items? Whose cord is this? Whose staff is this? Whose ring is this? And uh, she's like, do you know? Please tell me. There's nowhere for Judah to hide. He couldn't run anywhere. He's caught red-handed. It was him. Everybody knew. That's your signet. That's your cord. That's your staff. We recognize these things. He identified them. Yep, it's me. You are more righteous than I. Confessed his sin, his, sin, his wrongdoing. She was more righteous than him. And uh, Judah, it tells us, did not know her again. So they had that one encounter and that was it. She was vindicated. She was not put to death. And then this happens, verse 27. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. As if, I mean, Judah expected one, but here we have two. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand and the midwife took a, and tied a scarlet thread on his hand saying, This one came out first. 
But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out, and she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. This is a crazy story. I don't know if this can be explained scientifically, but <clears throat> there was two babies in there, and when she was giving birth, a hand comes out, they tie a scarlet thread to make sure to be able to identify this is the firstborn, but then the hand goes back in, and the other baby wrestles his way and comes out, and um, they called his name Perez, and his brother was Zara. Now, there's no biological explanation for how Perez beat his brother out of the womb. I don't know, is there? You're the expert. Does this right. thing, does this happen where one baby, a limb comes out and comes back in, and then the other twin comes out after? It can, yeah. Okay, so I guess I guess it's possible. I didn't know, uh, but apparently it is. But clearly, regardless, this was God's choice again. Uh, just like Jacob had stolen Esau's blessing because God had promised that the younger would or the older would serve the younger. So Perez would be counted as the firstborn and the promise would go through him and not his brother, even though technically his brother's arm had the scarlet thread, which identified the firstborn. But he didn't make it all the way past the finish line first. His brother actually did. And he would be uh, regarded as the royal uh, line of Judah would come through Perez, the brother that leapfrogged the other brother. King David is a direct descendant from Perez, and, and we know King David is a direct descendant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, 18 to 23 says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from, his, from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So what does an ancient story about deception and prostitution and pregnancy have to do with Christmas? Well, it turns out a lot. God used Tamar's deception and disobedience of Judah to continue, the, 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 to actually begin the royal line of Judah. That would eventually lead to Jesus, who would be the Savior of his people. All throughout Genesis, we see this amazing truth. From the first sin of Adam and Eve to Judah and Tamar, God is promising to send a, a seed from the woman to destroy the works of the serpent. And it wasn't a pretty journey from Adam to Christ. It wasn't all up. It was volatile. It was like, whoa, whoa, up and down, up and down. But no one and nothing could stop God from sending this Savior to seek and save the lost. So, look at what Matthew 1 tells us about Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Verse 21. He will save his people from their sins. That's why he came. That's why Jesus came. To save his people from what? Their sins, which are abundant. Now we have a skewed picture of Christmas, right? Like this. This is a skewed picture of Christmas. <laughs> it's um, nice, glittery. It's appealing to, to look at. It's um, very well crafted. Um, very peaceful. Very serene piece of art. This is what we think of when we think about Christmas. But Christmas represents a cosmic rescue mission, an invasion of God Almighty into time and space, into darkness. The birth of Christ was the beginning of the promise of Genesis 3, that God was sending a seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head. That little baby boy would grow into a man. He would 
confronts the kingdom of darkness by healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead. He taught his people the truth. He revealed the Father to them, and he brought a glimpse and taste of God's kingdom to earth wherever his feet uh, uh, set uh, on the earth. And his heel was bruised when he died on the cross, but that serpent's head was completely crushed when he rose from the dead. Now consider this passage again. Matthew 1, 3. And Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. It's not just a jumble of Hebrew names with no bearing on your life. It's chock full of rich history that points to the fact that human history is marred in sin, that our lives are marred in sin, that our lineages are marred in sin, that our family lines are marred in sin. But despite all the brokenness and ugliness of our history as a human people and our families individually, how they have a part in that, history was marching forward to the manger, to Christ, to the birth of the Savior of his people. Now, maybe your lineage isn't the most godly. Mine isn't. I look back on my family line and go, oh my gosh. Uh, I, I mean, look, I'm not perfect by any means, but I don't come from a righteous people. <laughs> I don't come from a righteous people. Uh, and, and, and nobody really does. Even, the Israel, even Jesus himself didn't come from a righteous people. Jesus' great, great, great grandfather is Judah, who slept with his daughter-in-law because he tried to kick her out of his house. And she, you know the story, I just shared it with you. So Jesus' family line is not a righteous family line. The royal line of, of the king of kings is, is drowning in sin. And we might look at that and go, well, how could that be? You know, maybe some religious, pious people will say, no, Jesus, Jesus' family line was perfect. Mary was sinless. She was born sinless. Like, come on, read the Bible. Mm -hmm. Read the Bible. He came from a sinful family to save them. That was the whole point. That was the whole point. That was the good news that the, the angel Gabriel tells Mary. He says, he will save his people from their sins. His people from their sins, implying his people are sinful, and he is the savior of them. And Jesus is still in the business of saving wretched sinners. God's still in the business of using our blunders and our sins and our wickedness to lead us to the king of the royal lineage, who is Jesus Christ. So as we move into Christmas season, that is, let's reflect on not just the baby, not just the beauty of the things we see at winners for $14.99 a couple years ago it's probably $30 with inflation now <clears throat> let's not reflect on just that enjoy that of course but let's not reflect on just that but the reason for that the reason for that is ugly the beauty of Christ uh is how do I say this the beauty of Christ is only uh recognized as beautiful when we realize how ugly our sin is when we look at our own sin and we think oh no that's not so bad then we miss the beauty of christ the beauty of christ is magnified when we realize how ugly we really are not physically we're all pretty good looking people here but i mean <laughs> spiritually the ugliness of our sin and when we see the baby in the manger when we see jesus and what he came to do it becomes beautiful to us because it's our salvation. He came to save his people from their sins. Yeah. So when you think about Christmas, here's what I want you to remember. Remember Adam and Eve eating the fruit. Remember Cain killing Abel. Remember Noah and the flood. Remember Abraham and Sarah's miraculous son Isaac. Remember the twins Esau and yeah. Jacob. Remember how Jacob stole Esau's blessing. Remember the mess that that caused. Remember the jealousy of Joseph's brothers, how they beat him up, how they stole his robe, how they sold him to foreigners as a slave. Remember Judah and Tamar. Remember that the history of mankind is not pretty. <laughs> Genesis up to now has been filled with just disastrous family situations after disastrous family situations. And as you remember the grim reality of, of our history, then when you see the baby in the manger and you see the Christmas slogans of hope and peace, 
they'll have greater weight and meaning for you. He came to set at peace a world at chaos, and it's still at chaos, but we can have peace in the midst of it. He came to give hope to a people in despair. He came to save his people from their sins, and he's doing exactly that. And nothing, nothing can stop it. We can't stop it. If we decide tomorrow, that's it, I'm done, I'm throwing in the towel, Jesus will still save his people from their sins. Regardless of the mess you're in, regardless of the mess maybe your family is in, regardless of all that deception you might find yourself entangled in, look to the son of Perez, Jesus Christ, who also came from a lineage of messed up people and crazy family dynamics and realize he is the savior he came to save the world he came to save you and he is doing just that and he'll do it and he said that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church and that's good news so let's pray thank you father for this word it's not a uh particularly comfortable story but even we see in it great comfort and hope that you bring because you are the lord and uh, you came to save your people from their sins so help us to remember that reality in the good things you're doing um, all around us help us to focus on that and to be at rest and peace in you in jesus name amen <laughs>